So here we are on the third day of January, and there's no place on earth the New York Jets would rather be than on the banks of Lake Erie here at chilly old Cleveland Stadium playing the Browns in the AFC semifinal. Cleveland with a lot of momentum after the regular season, having won their last five games and seven of their last eight, primarily through the offensive heroics of Bernie Kosar. The stage was set for anything but a quiet afternoon by the lake. Hang on, folks. Fasten your seatbelts. We could have a shootout here on the lakefront. Pitch out to McNeil. Running right. Uh-oh, it's going to be a flea flicker throwing back to Ryan. Ryan throwing long over the middle for Walker. And Walker's got a touchdown. Touchdown, Wesley Walker. What a great play to go. First and ten from the Jets 37. Fake handoff, fake reverse. Kosar gonna throw deep down the right side. Find no wide open at the ten. Five touchdown Browns. Indeed, it was a shootout until the Browns ran out of bullets and the Jets fired their final salvo. McNeil finds some room. McNeil still on his feet to the 20, 15, 10, 5, and touchdown! The Jets are going to win this football game. The Jets are going to the AFC Championship. Well, the fat lady hasn't sung yet, but you can believe she's in the wings warming up the pipes. Browns have to score on this drive. Ten points down with four minutes to play. Throwing passes at a record pace. Bernie Kosar completed five straight. As the Browns came back a yard at a time, 68 yards in nine plays. The final yard came courtesy of running back Kevin Mack, and the Browns were back in it with less than two minutes to play. Take them all the way, Bernie. Take them home. Side slaughter is open. He got the ball at the five yard line. I tell you what, those people at left better come on back because this ball game is not over. Now here's the snap, the hole, the kick is up. It is good, and the game is tied. The Browns have come back from an unbelievable disaster in time. Bernie the kid looked bad for a moment, but when the pressure was on, he came back and got the 10 points he needed. This place is absolutely bedlam. The stadium has gone berserk. Hey, we've been here before. You remember? We've been here before, not once, but twice. Now, third time's a charm for us. Yeah, One play at a time. Here we go, here we go, man. One play at a time, the Browns work their way toward the New York goal line. A chip shot field goal from 23 yards out would put a fast end to this fairy tale finish. But the same man, Mark Mosley, who kicked the Browns into overtime, couldn't kick them out of it. But that one missed kick never weakened the Browns' resolve. By stuffing the New Yorkers on three straight possessions, Cleveland's defense dominated overtime. Going into a second overtime period, the operative word was still patience. 60 yards and 11 plays, and the Browns' clutch performance allowed Mark Mosley the opportunity to redeem himself. Here we go. 37-yard attempt. The kick is up. It is good. The Browns have won the game. The Browns have won the game in double overtime. And the stadium is gone for Thank you, thank you. Cold history will never be able to transmit the range of emotions felt by one team thinking it had lost only to win, and another thinking it had won it all, only to lose. A young quarterback today threw for 489 yards to bring his team back in the final three minutes of regulation play. The stadium is pandemonium here. Cleveland Municipal Stadium has never seen a sight like this in its storied tradition. A double overtime, 23 to 20 Browns victory.
You've heard it. The Jets have won this ball game, and the Jets are going to the AFC Championship game. Well, as some guy once said, it ain't over till it's over, and that's what makes a great comeback one of the most memorable events in sports. Just when you think it's time to put out the fire and call in the dogs, the unbelievable happens. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's unforgettable. Hi, I'm Paul McGuire, and I've spent more than a few Sundays in this press box at Rich Stadium, home of the Buffalo Bills. It's also the site of the single greatest comeback in NFL history. For the next hour, we'll take a look at 15 of the most improbable comeback wins ever, not necessarily in the order of their importance, because they all have their own special qualities. We based our choices primarily on how far a team had to come from behind to win. What we're talking about here are teams who had every right to abandon all hope. There is no greater glory in competitive games than coming back to win. And when I hear the word comeback, I first think of one guy who became known as Captain Comeback. It's on two. It's on two. Ready? 23 Ready? times in his career, Roger Staubach guy did come from behind victories in the fourth quarter. 14 of them with less than two minutes to play or in overtime. I think the biggest thing about Roger was the fact that he never quit. It didn't matter how much the Cowboys were down. I remember in, in uh, San Francisco, they were ahead of us 14 or 15 points, and it was three minutes to go or something, and they were coming by our bench and hollering obscene things at us and talk, calling us losers. They laughed at us. They were making fun of us during the game because yeah, they were really enjoying having the upper hand on us. They didn't think there was any way because our offense was sputtering. We were doing absolutely nothing. And then Coach Lander decides to put Roger in, and I tell you, it was like a 180 degree turn around in offense. We went to Gresson's and Roger for some balls between linebackers that, that had the velocity that, that the receiver better catch it. It was, he was gonna be injured if he didn't catch it. Saw back to Billy Parks, pulled the Cowboys to within five points. But with barely a minute remaining, Dallas still needed the ball back. We had this uh, foreign kicker from Austria, Tony Fritz, he used to try all these tricky uh, ways of uh, kicking the ball. And he used to do this thing where he'd run up to the ball and run past it, and he'd kick it behind his back. So we got on the field and they said it was going to be an onside kick to the right. And when Tony went up to the ball, it looked like from San Francisco's point of view that the ball was going to be to the left. But when he crossed over, he went past the ball and then kicked with his left foot behind him. And it tricked him just enough for us to, to get the jump on the ball and Mel recovered, Mel Renfro recovered it. Once we got that onside kick, the, the, it definitely, the momentum turned. We got the ball back uh, on the onside kick, and you know, I scrambled for a first down and hit another pass to Parks, and it was the most unbelievable comeback because we were totally out of it. It wasn't even a, it wasn't even a pulse at one time during that game that we were going to win that game, and to turn it around, that's why you had such an emotional situation from our players because it really was a game that, unless you were just the most unbelievable believer, that you didn't think we were coming back. the beginning time for the great comebacks that Roger is so well known for throughout his career. When we won that game against San Francisco, from that moment on, we always believed that we could win the ball game. The man Roger Staubach replaced in that landmark game wound up in Denver five years later. And by 1979, Craig Morton had led his team to a Super Bowl. The Broncos became perennial contenders in the AFC West, but on this Sunday, Morton was on the sidelines. Not until the Seahawks had forged a huge lead did Morton replace starter Norris Weiss. With nine minutes left in the third quarter and 24 points behind. It was too early in the season for a loss to have a major impact on the Broncos. 
but their pride was on the line. And while John Elway was still a freshman in college, Craig Morton set the Bronco standard for comebacks. Second and goal at the two. Jensen and Armstrong now, and Morton rolling to his right, looking, throwing, touchdown! First down, Lytle and Jensen continue as the running backs. Morton throwing it quickly for Moses. Touchdown! David Moses! And the Broncos have scored two quick ones and are right back in business. Moses left, up church right. Morton straight back, pumping it once, throwing the pass for Upchurch. He'll have to hurry. He's got it for a touchdown! Morton pumped back and then threw as Upchurch broke loose. Third and goal at the one. Lytle cuts to the right and scores in the Broncos lead! Denver 37-34. Since joining the NFL, no Denver team has ever come from 24 points behind to win. And if you ever asked who the quarterback was in Denver's greatest comeback win ever, only a few might say, Craig Morton. I guess a little of Roger Staubach's comeback magic rubbed off on Craig Morton, uh, at least on that afternoon. You know, most guys never even get one chance to play in a game like that. I know. I played for 11 years and never got close to coming from that far behind a win. And we had some great teams. But it doesn't take a great team to come back. Even a bad one can have an occasional lapse into greatness. Since winning two division titles in the mid-70s, the Cardinals have not contended for much other than the first pick in the college draft. The Buccaneers' history is filled with frustration as well. And Bucks head coach Ray Perkins certainly played his part. Two weeks before, he watched his team build a 20-point lead over the Chicago Bears. Somehow, somewhere, it vanished in the glare of the South Florida sun. But on this afternoon in St. Louis, Tampa Bay built an even bigger lead, one they could not help but keep until they hit a wall in the fourth period. It's been said that the sooner you fall behind, the more time you have to catch up. Well, the Cardinals had less than 15 minutes. But after a play action pass to Stump Mitchell lit the fuse for the Cardinals, St. Louis detonated an explosion of points. Lomax on the option to the left side, raises up, throws in zone, oh, caught, touchdown, they won't! Robert A. Wong. Second down play, they pitch it left to Wilder. He cuts across the 20 and fumbles the ball. Cardinals the Cardinals have it. Nico Nogan. Touchdown. Touchdown. Right. Touchdown, Nico Nogan. From the Tampa Bay 11, JT wide right. Lomax dropping, setting, looking, looping it toward the end zone. Touchdown, right. JT Smith. Third and six from the Tampa Bay 16. Lomax drops. Here comes the rush. Slops it toward the end zone. The 28 unanswered points represented the greatest fourth quarter comeback in NFL history. A quick postscript. Ray Perkins returned to college coaching three years later and in 1992 posted a 1 and 10 record at Arkansas State. That same season, former Cardinals head coach Gene Stallings won the national championship at Alabama. Championships are something the Detroit Lions used to win in the 1950s. But after a long dry spell, the men from the Motor City turned out a winning model in 1991. After the Minnesota Vikings coasted to a 17-point lead, the Lions showed they too have comeback character. And they waited until the final quarter to prove it. It was evident this would not be a year when the Lions snored. Rodney back to throw, sets, looking right, fires long, wide open, Clark, 40! 30, near side, 20 to the 15, to the 10, 5, touchdown! Lions, Robert Clark, just like that, 68 yards, and a touchdown for the Lions. An onside kick, high bounce, loose ball, and it is. Let's see. Lions think they have it, and they do at the 43 yard line. How about that? 
Rodney Pete, back to throw, the end zone, open green, touchdown, Lions, to Willie Green, who else? There was not much of the road left, but there's always plenty of room for all-pro Barry Sanders. And it was Barry's late game running that kept the Lions alive as the clock wound down. The Vikings looked like they were standing still, and I think they were out of shape. The Lions' time of possession, having the ball most of the time in this fourth quarter, has done the job. Third down, less than a yard from inside the 15. It's Barry, and he's open to the 10, 5, touchdown, Lions! It was the greatest comeback in Lions history. And 10 weeks later, Detroit coach Wayne Fonts earned his first division title. Division titles came in bunches for Minnesota's Bud Grant, 11 to be exact, along with four conference championships. But in 1977, the Vikings were severely tested. When Grant lost his future Hall of Fame quarterback, many Vikings fans were about to kiss the season goodbye. Losing somebody like Tarkington, who in our opinion is the best quarterback in football today, you know, is a loss you can't compensate for in any fashion with any player or by any uh, uh, specific means. So we feel fortunate that we have the quarterbacks that we have. Strength at quarterback ran three deep for the Vikings, and in the fourth quarter, rookie Tommy Kramer replaced starter Bob Lee. In only his second NFL game, Kramer found himself in a hole no one expected him to climb out of. Kramer tossed scoring passes to both Ahmad Rashad and tight end Bob Tucker to bring Minnesota to within striking distance. And with 138 remaining, Kramer threw the longest touchdown pass of the Vikings season. The 69-yard pass to Sammy White earned Minnesota a one-point comeback win on their way to their fifth straight NFC Central Division Championship. Championships have been a big part of the Raiders' tradition, along with a commitment to excellence and pride in poise. But when they opened the 76 season against the team of the 70s, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they were in trouble. Their defensive line was decimated with injuries. And from the way the game began, there was no indication that these same Raiders would go on to win their first Super Bowl four months later. After the Steelers mounted a 28-14 lead with three minutes to go, it appeared they were on a fast track to their third straight Super Bowl. The Raiders were stripped of everything, except their will to strike back. It was at about that time, with three minutes showing on the clock, that a snake coiled Down, he throws, is it? and struck. The pass is caught by Casper. Touchdown, Raiders! Oh, after the blocked punt, the Raiders got the ball back with 147 on the clock. And after three straight incompletions, the snake, Ken Stabler, made a key fourth down connection. But Stabler's biggest contribution came one play later. The touchdown tied the score. And after the Raiders' Willie Hall intercepted Terry Bradshaw's next pass, rookie kicker Fred Steinfort came on to make his mark in his first NFL game. The old continue to live by the very 
unintelligible, the terribly cliched skins of their collective teeth. For years, the Raiders have prided themselves on their silver and black mystique, their pride and their poise, their commitment to excellence. But since winning Super Bowl 18, they haven't been back. Maybe they left their waterfront brand of football back in Oakland. But on one Monday night in 1988, they gathered up some of that old Raider magic and turned the tables on their division rivals, the Denver Broncos. Right. On a Monday night in Mile High Stadium, linebacker Dave Ryan and the defending AFC champion Broncos defense set its sights on Raiders quarterback Jay Schrader. Recently acquired from the Redskins, Schrader got his first taste of the high country. Here comes the blitz, there he goes, sack, Dennis Smith. Yeah, Dennis! Way to go, DS, it's way, babe. Trojan left! Yeah, you're over here. No heavy, no heavy! Throughout the first half, the Denver defense was clever, tough, and aggressive. Ram! 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 Those are the hit intercepted. Picked off at the 13-yard line by Simon Fletcher. Tyro Braxton hitting Schrader as he let the ball go. And it went right to Simon Fletcher. On offense, John Elway ignited a first-half attack that was virtually unstoppable. A 35-yard pass was converted to an 86-yard gain by Vance Johnson to set up the first of two Tony Dorsett touchdown runs. Meanwhile, the Denver defense kept pounding out the hits. During the first 30 minutes, Denver could do little wrong as the running of Sammy Winder and the passing of Elway to Steve Sewell lifted Denver into a seemingly insurmountable 24-point halftime lead. In the second half, the complexion of the game changed suddenly and dramatically. Rolling to the right is Schrader, throwing to an open man. Smith at the 35. Out of room, down to the 30, the 20, racing to the 10. Breaks a tackle, touchdown Raiders! Schrader fakes, drops one off in the hands of Steve Smith, left side running to the 40, down the side to the 30, he's got open field. Touchdown Raiders! The Raiders were storming back and the Broncos could do nothing to stop them. We gave him life, we gotta take it away. We gotta take the life away from him. Snap to Schrader inside, hand off to Allen, he races for the end zone, touchdown Raiders! Oh man! Too much, too much. Come on! Spot, kick, on the way. It is good! Barr has tied it up! Holy Toledo! In overtime, the Raiders' first round draft pick and Heisman Trophy winner, Tim Brown, set out to put a quick end to the wildest game of the 1988 season. Brown waiting near the left side. He's at the 24, up the field of the 30. There's a flag down. He speeds past two men at the 50. He goes past the kicker. 40, 30, there's a flag down. 20, 10, touchdown, but it won't be, I'm sure. Holy Toledo, 76 yards, but that flag is looming there. Yellow on green, and that is a stop sign for the Raiders. 531 left in the overtime tied at 27. Snap to Elway. Despite the penalty, there was no emotional letdown on the part of the Raiders. They just kept coming. Still looking upfield, pressured back to the 30-yard line, back to the 25, gets a block, throws a pass upfield, and it's intercepted at the 50. Brought back over the 40 and down to the Denver 31-yard line. football game right now. Snap, spot, kick. Yeah. Raiders win. The Raiders 
Phillies win one of the great victories in the history of the silver and black franchise. And one of the most stunning defeats in the history of the Denver Broncos franchise. Is there any such thing as a safe lead? Well, 25 years ago, Vince Lombardi said, if you take a 28-point lead into the fourth quarter, you're home free. And so far, he's been right. No team has ever come from that far behind in the fourth quarter to win. But in 1985, the Minnesota Vikings came as close as anyone to proving that theory wrong. A cold December day in Philadelphia was not the problem for the Vikings. After all, they played outside in Minnesota. Their problem was they fielded a starting lineup that included seven rookies and backup Wade Wilson at quarterback. And if ever there was a game that tested a team's character, it was this emotional encounter against the Eagles. Pass over the middle of the race, he goes into the end zone for the touchdown. Bootleg, roll to the left, and he's going to be sacked. He fumbles in the backfield, picked up by Teal. He can score a touchdown. Willie's at the 40. He's at the 30. He's going to go all the way on a Jaworski fumble, and the Vikings have their second touchdown. He was hardly a secret weapon. But after three years in the USFL, Anthony Carter was not yet a household word. But in the last four minutes, the Eagles had only wished he was still in some other league. Wade Wilson takes the snap, drops back to pass, scrambles to his right, throws it deep down the right side. He's got Carter open. Touchdown! Touchdown for the center banking! Oh, Anthony Carter beats the deep man, Brandon Wilson. He cuts the ball at the goal line. An incredible comeback! The Minnesota Vikings did indeed reacquaint themselves with the roots of their past, posting one of the most amazing comebacks in NFL history. The Detroit Lions, who carried the Western Conference title battle all the way to a postseason playoff, played one of their key games of 1957 with the Baltimore Colts. It's a 76-yard dilly. Johnny Unitas and the Colts are giving Detroit real trouble. Unitas cranks up and throws his third touchdown strike of the game to give Baltimore a 21-3 halftime lead. Now the Motor City men are moving. Gene Gedman speeds to the outside. Tobin Road is running the Lions offense. Tobin's toss is on target to Steve Junker as the Lions now have 10 to the Colts 27. Bobby Lane takes over where Rote left off. Hop along Cassidy lassos his pass and pounds to a touchdown. Detroit's getting closer, but time is running out. With three minutes left, the Lions get the ball again. Lane fires to Cassidy, and the Baltimore lead is narrowed to 27-24. All the Colts have to do is hang on to the ball, but they can't. Yale Larry recovers the Baltimore bobble on the Colt 29. With 46 seconds left, the stage is set for a fabulous finish, and Detroit doesn't disappoint. Hopalong Cassidy hauls in Lane's lead pass, and the Lions complete a spectacular 24-point comeback to defeat the Baltimore Colts 31-27 on their way to the top of the Western Conference. Later that year, these same Lions met San Francisco in a playoff game for the Western Conference title. In old Kizar Stadium, Coach Frankie Albert and the 49ers brass anticipated a win that would vault Siddle passing and Hugh McElhenney running. The 49ers jumped to a 24-7 halftime lead. Rumor had it they already had champagne on ice in their locker room. And naturally, if I was, we heard a little bit of the celebration and then found out later from some of the players that they were. They were really, they weren't drinking the champagne naturally, but they were very confident they were going to be opening the champagne and, and that their wives had already spent the championship money for fur coats and houses and cars and so on. I suppose we were happy, happy as could be at 24 to 7 to be leading and uh, uh, Christensen probably heard that and, uh, and figured that we felt the game was over, but we certainly knew that we had 30 minutes of football left. <laughs> At the start of the third quarter, Tittle pitched out to McElhenney. As the champagne got colder, number 39 danced through the Lions' defense for 71 yards. 
But despite the big gain, it was soon evident that the 49ers' wave was cresting. I really believe that if I would have went in to score at that time, that would have been the end of the game. I don't think they would have been able to catch up with us. I don't know why. I think that they would have maintained what they had the first half, continued on the same offensive premise that we would have been in trouble, but they sort of laid on the lead. With Tobin Roque filling in for Bobby Lane at quarterback, the Lions balanced their catch-up passing game with the run, and running the ball was another backup, second-year man Tom Tracy. And it was Tracy's two touchdowns that hurt the 49ers most in one of the greatest come-from-behind wins in playoff history. The 49ers moved out of Kizar Stadium in 1970, but the echoes of that game linger there to this day. And that's the ball game. With an unbelievable, With an unbelievable comeback. comeback. Detroit's Detroit never say never die say Lions die defeat San Francisco, Francisco 31 to 27 to capture the Western the Conference, Western Conference, Conference Championship. 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 So the Lions pulled it off without their Hall of Fame quarterback, and they did it mostly by running the ball. But historically, the real comeback kids are the quarterbacks. The Montanas, the Starbucks, they always. And for the past 12 years, no one has submitted comeback credentials as impressive as Bronco quarterback John Elway. Through the 1992 season, Elway has led his team from behind to win 30 times in the fourth quarter. And here is one of his best ever. Ah! Ah! Let's rock, baby! We gotta turn it up! Got to turn it up! It's time to rumble! The AFC's top-ranked defense came out swinging. You ain't gonna catch none of that on me today. Unfortunately, the Houston Oilers came out scoring. Hey! Hey! Keep your poise! Just keep your poise! Come on, man! Denver's poise was severely tested as Houston scored touchdowns on their first three possessions. They want to go deep, man. They want to go deep now. They think they can blow us out. But instead of a blowout, the defense patched up the holes and began battling back, creating ways to get its offense back on the field. You coming back on their ass. They should have let us in the game. Each time the game appeared to be slipping away, John Elway calmly grabbed the reins and headed the Broncos back in the right direction. Elway from the gun. This is a fourth down play. Being flushed out. Here's the pass. Caught by Young. First down. Gets away. 30, 25, 20. He's down to the 16-yard line. Michael Young's clutch effort set up the first of two short yardage touchdowns by Greg Lewis, number 41. And Elway would pass for another to Vance Johnson. Hit the zone, zone, zone. Back he goes, there's the pass, touchdown, Vance With less than seven minutes remaining, Denver closed to within a single point at 24 to 23. Now, it was up to the defense to rough up the Oilers and get the ball back. With the Broncos' main hope stuck on the bench, Denver's defense, led by Carl Mecklenburg, rose up to stop the Oilers. The dogged determination of the Denver defense had set the stage for another legendary comeback. And things looked good until the ball was kicked. This scenario was taking on a painfully familiar look. Man, they got the ball. We got the ball in the two. However, five years earlier in Cleveland, the Broncos actually had more time to work their magic. Hey, D, it ain't over yet, though, baby. It ain't over yet. That's all right, baby. It ain't over. It ain't over, baby. It ain't over yet. I mean, you could 
didn't ask for more. John Elway has a chance here. It's a long way to go. Denver at the two-yard line. They're 98 yards away from six, but they don't need six. They only need three. This game is far from over. I've seen this club move too many times to think it's over. 24-23 the score. Elway in the shotgun and in the end zone. Here's his pass. It's caught. Young makes it out of the 24-yard Denver had escaped from their own end zone. But three plays later, an entire season came down to one very big play. Damn! It's the game right here, four for six, it's the game. We need this. Down to a minute 28. Elway, he's got some time. Flushed out, rolls out, being chased. Here's Elway, first down at the 35 yard line. You can say what you want to. I don't think I want anybody back there except number seven. Three plays later, another fourth down. And this time, 10. Patient under pressure and calm amidst the chaos, Elway reached deep into his pocket full of miracles to pull out still one more magnificent moment. God, dang, come on. Here's the fourth down and 10 play. Elway's got the ball. John is back, runs up out of the pocket, lets the pass go, it's caught. Johnson to the 40, 35, 30, 25, and out of bounds at the 21 yard line of the Islanders. Oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. John Elway had further enhanced his reputation as the ultimate escape artist. A quarterback who always seemed cornered, but never conquered and Vance Johnson's stunning catch and carry ushered the Broncos into field goal range. Unbelievable. If I had seen it with my own eyes, I don't think I'd believe it. Steve Sewell carried the Broncos 10 yards closer to victory's threshold. Sewell swings to the 20, to the 15, to the 11 yard line. It's all you, baby. It's all you. Yeah, it's all you, baby. He got it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, my God. Well, I tell you, you ought to knight the guy. Gave us a chance, that's all we Denver's offense had run 11 plays without a timeout in less than two minutes. Now, it was up to holder Gary Kubiak and kicker David Treadwell. Kubiak will hold. Here's the snap. The kick is... There is no statistic for poise, but that is what made the Denver Broncos champions. It's a great feeling, though. You got to remember this feeling. You don't get these feelings very often. You know, man. You got a game you love to win. Tell you, we can do it here because of John. Yeah. Fueled by the fiery spirit of John Elway and talented teammates excited by his daring play, the 1991 Denver Broncos persevered and believed when no one else did, battling back to become comeback champions once more. No doubt John Elway can be considered in the same company of that officer and a gentleman who was commissioned Captain Comeback back in 1972. Staubach's cowboy career was punctuated by many gallant last gasp comebacks. But against the Redskins in his final regular season game, Staubach wrote a script that had more drama than a Hollywood thriller. That was probably the best game that Roger ever played for us because the odds were so much against us, even more than it was back in the 49er game. He had to bring our club back against From the beginning to the end, it was comebacks by both teams. And uh, we came back 21-17 and looked like we had total control of the game. And then all of a sudden... And that may be more than the Cowboys can overcome. I was recording the game with KRL Day as a guest broadcaster that day. and In my heart, I believed that the Cowboys were going to win the game. And uh, my announcer, the co-announcer with me, Brad Shem, kept saying, hey, Charlie, there's no way. The game's over. So, Brad, hey, you got to believe that this team can win. We always believe that if we could just get the ball back to Rogers somehow. Clock is running, 2.38 left in the game. 
Can it happen again? A long spring. 220 left in the game. Can they do it again? You've got to believe, Brad. Woo! With barely a minute remaining, the Cowboys needed the ball back and stirred by the inspirational play of Captain Comeback. Veteran Larry Cole, number 63, stopped the Redskins dead in their tracks. Larry Cole stopped uh, John Riggins on a third and two play to turn over the possession to the Cowboys. The school was out. It was, it was going to happen, and I think everybody in the stadium knew it. A minute one left in the game. This is an all-timer. When Roger got in that situation, he was going to win it for you, and, and everybody felt he was going to win that one. Cowboys at the Redskin 33, second down 10. From the shotgun, Staubach has time, throws, caught. You got to love them. I mean, you got to love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. They can pull it out. 42 seconds left in the game. Redskins lead by six. How can you live like this? Dude? The impossible may come true. There was none better at that. The Cowboys have won the East. The Cowboys have come from behind twice. Unbelievably. I ain't never seen nothing like this. Just another day at the office, Brad. Yeah, just, you know. <laughs> It proved to be the last hurrah for this legendary Dallas Cowboy. As the cheers for Staubach faded, a future star was waking up the echoes in San Francisco. For eight seasons, Candlestick Park was home to a franchise in decline, until 1980, when Bill Walsh named second-year man Joe Montana as his starting quarterback. Back then, the only team worse than the 49ers in the NFC West were the Saints. But they were unafraid to show their faces despite a winless season and produced five first half scores. The thing that gave me some hope, not that we necessarily would win, but we could come out and play good football, was the fact that, we, that when we went toward our dressing room at the end of the half, our players ran as a group obviously with the thought in mind of regrouping and coming out and getting something done. So you could sense it as you went toward the dressing room that we were not a beaten team. What Wall sensed was a comeback spirit, snowballed into an unstoppable force. Montana back to throw, big rush put on. He throws, he completes it underneath to Dwight Clark. He's the 40, the 45, he's the 50. He goes to the 40, it's a foot race, the 30. The 10, the 5, touchdown, 49ers. That may be the one play that'll wake up the 49ers. Back to throw Montana. He's being rushed, look out, he throws. He has Solomon open at the 5, breaks the tackle, throws the outside, touchdown, 49ers. A team that believes in itself can make anything happen. What happened with one minute, 50 seconds left was a game tying score by Lenville Elliott. Elliott trying to find some room, he does. He goes in for the touchdown. Oh, Elliott put on a brilliant move at about the six yard line. And it looked like that one wasn't going any place. Well, I said, at the start of the second half, this was either going to be one of the greatest stories in 49er history or a very terrible football game. It is approaching being one of the great stories. In overtime, the 49ers moved toward the climax of the story. And Ray Wershing was put in range for a 35-yard field goal. Between 30 and 39 yards, Wershing has missed just once. This will be just outside the 25. Montana to place the ball down. It is high, placed down. It's kicked. It is long enough. It is good! Ray Wershing with the greatest comeback the 49ers have made as they win it by a score of 38 to 35. Coming from behind like this could last the 49ers many years from the standpoint those veteran players will recall that they did come from that far behind and I think give the team a certain amount of poise and confidence 
in future years when we are behind and, and must come back and win. Montana, Staubach, Elway, each has orchestrated their share of comeback drama, but none of them have ever been behind by 32 points and one, ever. And in this very stadium in January 1993, backup quarterback Frank Reich and the Buffalo Bills found themselves so hopelessly out of it that over 10 million Americans turned off their television to pursue other interests. What they missed was the wildest wild card game ever. Fasten your seatbelts, it's playoff time. The Bills and the Oilers ready to get it on in an AFC wild card game. And the road to the Super Bowl, Project Pasadena, starts here at Orchard Park, New York this afternoon. The Bills will have to travel the long way to get back to the Super Bowl this year. They will have to go on the road if they beat the Oilers this afternoon. And they will have to beat them without their number one man, Jim Kelly. Frank Wright will start at quarterback. For the Houston Oilers, it will be their top gun in the run and shoot, Warren Moon. So, as I said, fasten your seatbelts. It's time to play football in Orchard Park. The run and shoot never fired with more precision. Warren Moon completed 19 of 22 passes in leading the Oilers to touchdowns on all four of their first half possessions. play a better first half of offensive football than the orders have just played. Tom, it just, it just doesn't get any better. They can't stop you. You Backups that. have played a large part in many great comebacks. But for quarterback Frank Reich, it appeared too much to overcome. So at halftime, the Bills found themselves in this very locker room down by 25 points. And it was here that Coach Marv Levy stared down at his players and told him, whatever happens, you guys have to live with yourselves after today. This is when the Texan sings. Turn out the lights, the party's over. But somehow the Bills didn't buy into the lyrics, despite what happened next. Right from the shotgun, four-man rush for the Oilers. Right throwing it to the right through the hands of McKellar. It's picked up, McDowell, down the far sideline, 40, 30. He misses the man there. You know, the lights are on here at Rich Stadium. They've been on since this morning. You can pretty much turn them out on the uh, Bills right now. Actually, the feeling that you had to have had was that your season was over, but let's go out like men. Let's go out fighting. And when we scored a couple of times quickly, um, you say, well, maybe we've got a glimmer of a chance. And then you score another one. You say, you know, we got more than a glimmer, and then it gains momentum for you. Now they overshift. May give it to Carwell here. No, it's Davis running left, trying to get to the corner flag, and he is in for the touchdown. So the Bills have finally scored. To get back in the game, the Bills needed every bounce of the ball to go their way. And a little outside kickoff, and it didn't go far enough. Wait a minute. Yes, it did. Let's see who got the ball. Yes, sir. Bills may have the ball. You better believe they do. They and guess ball. who does it? Christie. Christie got his own outside kickoff. So maybe the Bills can turn it here. The ball was back in Wright's hands, and four plays later, it was back in the end zone. Man rush drops back in the pocket, sails it long. Oh, oh BB at the ten, at the five, in for the touchdown. Suddenly, Rich Stadium has awakened. Four twenty-nine left in the third. Here is Wright. Looking to throw, rolls out, throws, down there is uh, Reed at the five, in for the touchdown! Andre Reed has scored! And now the Bills are back in this game! As this game swung, ho ho ho, like a tidal wave here at Rich Stadium! And now the Bills trail by 11 points, 35-24. By the third score, there's no question that uh, there was an anxiety, I don't know if you want to 
define it as panic, but there was a sense of urgency to do something and a realization that if somebody didn't go out and make a play and turn this thing around, that the momentum that Buffalo had gained now was had reached uh, overwhelming proportions. This, uh-huh. you can overcome, baby. You can overcome this. A Buffalo interception set the Bills up again in Houston territory. But it was a critical fourth down gamble that helped Buffalo maintain momentum. Fourth and five at the 18. There's the snap. He backs up. He looks. He throws. Three touchdown. The Bills are back in it now. Big time. It is pandemonium here at Rich Stadium. Houston's flawless first-half execution transgressed into second-half disintegration. We didn't make a first down in the third quarter. That ball started bouncing their way, and that's just the way that game was. It makes you sick to be on the on losing end of a deal like that. Get down, get down. We finally got it going the fourth quarter after going in two times and, and three plays and out and drove it about 75 yards. But that's the one where we didn't put it in the end zone. And I think everybody's heart totally broke at that point when we snapped for the field goal effort and it went through the holder's hands and we didn't get it. To see it come up empty handed, I know there was a sense of, hey, we're in trouble. The Bills, meanwhile, could do no wrong. With stars like Cornelius Bennett, Jim Kelly, and Thurman Thomas on the sidelines, Frank Wright continued to pave the comeback trail patiently, one play at a time. And with just over three minutes remaining in the fourth quarter, the Houston Oilers watched their 32-point lead officially disappear. The throw, he looks, he throws, touchdown! Andre Reid for the touchdown! The Bills have scored! They have scored to take the lead with 3-0 to play in the game. Andre Reid, three straight touchdowns, and the Bills... The Oilers salvaged some pride after Warren Moon's passing put them in position to force an overtime period. But sudden death simply delayed the inevitable for the shell-shocked Oilers. Takes the snap, drops back, has time, looking around, throws, intercepted by the Bills! Nate Odom's interception had the Bills poised for victory and realizing what they were about to accomplish. Now you talk about character, this is one. This is a team, damn it. One mere formality remained before the Bills could make history. Bills can win it here. Wright puts it down. The kick is on the way. There were so many thoughts that went through your mind during the game as you're coming back, like, you know, geez, is this meant to be that we're going to come back and win, or, or is it just not? And so when the field goal went through, I was just overcome by emotion. I was just, you know, I guess I was just so thankful for the opportunity to participate in a game like that. To be part of it, you know that you're making history at the very time you're making it. Sometimes uh, you do something which has a historic impact, but you don't realize it at the time. In this instance, we did. It was um, uh, an emotion uh, after the game that I don't think I had ever experienced over a 40-year coaching career. In overcoming a 32-point deficit, Frank Reich and the Miracle Bills took their place in football lore as architects of a game for the ages.
So that was it. The greatest comeback in NFL history, the Buffalo Bills. The ultimate champions of a lost cause. Almost as good as winning a Super Bowl? Uh, maybe. For that one afternoon, the Bills drew on all the time-honored sporting gifts. Skill, poise, concentration, strategy, boldness, patience, luck, and the heart to say, never say die. So for all the comeback kids, I'm Paul McGuire.